Let's continue. Now the narrator shifts our attention to Sancho. It's like saying meanwhile, but more elegant and with a humorous and antiquated tone. It would be well to leave him enveloped in his sighs and verses in order to recount what befell Sancho Panza on his mission. This easy, familiar tone with which Cervantes always addresses his reader is yet another aspect that distinguishes him from the other novelists of his day. Recall that Sancho was on his way to see Dulcinea on behalf of his master. Sancho eventually arrives at Maritornes' inn where he had been blanketed and so still doubtful about whether or not to go inside, but also seized by hunger, he approaches with caution. Two men recognize him. Here Cervantes displays his mastery of dialogue by combining theatricality and spontaneity in a subtle conversation between two men whom we still do not know. Notice the novelist's amazing ability to gradually let us in on who these characters are, what they know, and how they know it. I say, Mr. Licentiate, that man on the horse, is he not Sancho Panza? the one our adventurer's housekeeper told us went off with her master as his squire? Indeed it is, said the licentiate, and that's the horse of our Don Quixote. Another marvelous aspect of this supposedly simple chatter is that it leads us into the ethical theme of penance. First, the narrator informs us that the two men are the priest and the barber, referring to the Inquisition, when he adds that they are the ones who had performed the scrutiny and the public condemnation of the books. When Sancho dissembles, claiming that he cannot betray his master by the very eyes he had in his head, a legal formula from the time of the Reconquista, the barber reacts with the tenacity of a detective, insisting that if Sancho does not tell them where Don Quixote is, we will conclude as we already have, that you killed and robbed him since you are riding his horse. What is more, when the barber adds that if not brown, morena, which means there would be trouble, he makes another figurative reference to the questionable ethnicity of Dulcinea. Finally, when Sancho relents, I'm not the kind of man who robs or kills anyone, we already know that this is a big fat lie. The Sierra Morena itself is very much a symbolic labyrinth of ethnic and ethical proportions. And Sancho has another problem. When the priest asks him to show them the notebook with the letter in it, the squire cannot find it because Don Quixote had kept it and had not given it to him, nor had he remembered to ask him for it. Wow, is Don Quixote crazy or is he just sneaky? Now it's Sancho who acts insane. He gave himself half a dozen punches in the face and nose, which he left bathed in blood. Why? Not for forgetting the letter to Dulcinea, but because he has lost in an instant three asses, for every one of them was like a castle. We already know what Sancho earns from a single ass, so how much has he just lost? Let's see, 26 maravedis per day times three, and what's a castle worth? Never mind. Just note that at this he told them about the loss of his gray. Poor Sancho, always on the verge of so much booty. Now the barber asks Sancho to recite his master's letter from memory, and the squire again plays the fool. Sancho Panza paused and scratched his head, trying to bring to mind the letter, and now he stood on one foot and then the other, sometimes staring at the ground, sometimes at the sky. He can't remember. All he recalls is that at the beginning it said, high and descendant lady. This is hilarious and ominous at the same time. Instead of soberana senora or sovereign lady, Sancho says sobajada senora, meaning humiliated woman. The reaction of the priest and the barber is priceless. Cervantes clearly enjoyed the humor of this passage. The two men derived no small amusement in watching Sancho Panza's good memory, and so they praised him much for it and asked him to repeat the letter two more times so that they too could commit it to memory, obviously laughing at his inanities. Sancho recited it again three more times, and each time he added 3,000 more absurdities. Then the squire lists all the promises made by Don Quixote, 
once the knight becomes an emperor, or at least a king, and all according to the valor of his person and the strength of his arm, Don Quixote will marry Sancho to a daughter of the empress, heir to a rich and grand estate. In short, the madness of Don Quixote had dragged after it the judgment of the poor man. Notice how Cervantes' free, indirect style facilitates humor. The narrator reports that the priest and the barber told him that he should pray to God for the health of his master, and that it was a possible and very feasible thing to come, over the course of time, to be an emperor, as he had said, or at least an archbishop, or some other equivalent dignitary. Then we have Sancho's depressed but hilarious reaction. I would like to know now how archbishops errant usually reward their squires. The priest, surely reflecting on the corruption of the church at that time, responds with precision regarding the salary Sancho could expect. They customarily grant them a simple post or make them a curate or some sacristan, which pays them a nice fixed income, in addition to the altar fees, which are usually worth about as much. The narrator concludes this haggling with a poetic and Eucharistic phrase. The priest came to substantiate an idea much in accord with Don Quixote's tastes and with what they wanted to achieve. In an episode full of transvestism, the priest now decides to dress in the garb of a wandering damsel so as to then ask Don Quixote to avengeth a wrong that an evil knight hadst done unto her, and at the same time she would beggeth of him not to ask that she removeth her veil, and that he should not inquire unto anything touching on her estate until such time as he hath madest right the grievance done unto her by that evil knight. Notice that now, thanks to the free and direct style, we can't tell if it is the narrator or the priest who mocks Don Quixote. Can free indirect style be made even more indirect by triangulating it? And take note, thou hadst arrived at the middle of thy novel. Oh, and women's veils will be symbolic henceforth. To review, halfway through the novel, is Don Quixote French, Spanish, or Basque? with respect to the Battle of Roncesvalles? And is he a Catholic, or a heretic, or just a crybaby? All the absurdities that Don Quixote undertakes in the Sierra Morena seem silly, but they are not far from the novel's main issues, especially its complex web of national, religious, and ethnic identities. And what exactly happened to the asinine bill of exchange between Don Quixote and Sancho? Finally, this bit about the priest dressing up as a maid has to remind us of the confused sexual identities of so many of the novel's women who are slightly masculine, such as Maritornes or Torralba, or even, as we saw in the previous chapter, Aldonza Lorenzo. What is the meaning of all this sexual chaos?